My name is Bibi. I am doing a very first YouTube video today and probably will not make any more after this. I just really wanted to get this information out there. It's just a, a few things I wrote, a, a long paper that I wrote, which I can't memorize, so I'll read it. Forgive the paper crumpling sound. Uh, it's about what I wrote about some of my things that I've learned in the occult and some of the things that I've learned about how it relates to Freemasonry. So I'm just going to go ahead and read it because I really want to get this out there. Okay. I'm writing this in obedience to Paul's exhortation to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For those that don't know me, I am an ex-pagan. But more importantly, I am a blood-bought, born-again child of the living God through the Lord and Savior, Jesus. When I was pagan, I was deeply into Wicca, a religion established by a Freemason, Gerald Gardner. Wicca in and of itself is new, however, the teachings and traditions of it are anything but new. Its lies and deception are based on Satan's first two lies. One. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And, second, ye shall not surely die. Think of Wicca as a pagan religion soup, with heavy notes of Druidism, Hindu and Eastern mysticism, Gnostic heresy, and a few dashes each of Luciferian theosophy and folk magic. Gardner used several words and phrases for purpose in Wicca which are common to Freemasonry. They share these terminologies. And let me just stop here and say, I don't mean in any way to condemn individual pagans or individual Masons. You probably mean very well as I meant well. However, you're in something that you don't understand. And I'm hoping to clarify that by getting this out there. So here's some examples of the phrases that Freemasonry and Wicca share. So mote it be. This means to set something into motion, to enter into agreement. Another way to phrase that would be, may it be. Adept, A-D-E-P-T, adept. One who is skilled, learned, and proficient in knowledge of the craft. Neophyte. A beginner in learning the mysteries. The craft, capital C. Practice of masonry or Wicca. Now, one may not be a mason except for people who profess faith in God. Little g God, doesn't matter. Any God will suffice. No atheists may join. This is because masonry despite the world's understanding, is not a benign men's social club in which guys do a bunch of charity work, play dress up, and guard the, lo uh, the lodge from Cowans. It is an ancient pagan mystery religion system of belief disguised as a social club. Only high-ranking masons know this. Regrettably, the uh, front porch masons, as I have called them, they'll never know they won't get to hear the truth because it's veiled by the hoodwink of Freemasonry, which was actually never pulled from their eyes after the first initiation. The black velvet remains in the form of secret doctrine, veiled in plain sight, but scattered. If only they would use the Masonic adage of gather what is scattered, they might see the truth. But they must dig because the true meanings are kept hidden on purpose. I believe, based on my former unholy affinity for masonry and pagan deities, that high-ranking masons, not the front porch masons, high-ranking masons are concealing a quite nefarious agenda and an unholy allegiance. I'm going to take a detour right now and explain some things about my paganism journey. So 
in my worship, it started off with just the basic tenets of Wicca, and I included deities from the nations where my ancestors came from. I was hoping that familiar spirits from these lines would, that maybe were already attached to me would be invoked. So, but one thing led to another, and as Wicca led me deep into the occult, I discovered Freemasonry by reason of Gerald Gardner being a Mason. I wanted to see what that was all about. I was impressed and seduced, not yet knowing why Wicca and Masonry were so similar. I bought a book about the Masons, which contained some superficial information regarding their history and practices. It was pretty neutral, neither giving praise or condemnation. So I found in this book an image of Baphomet. I began to worship him and his image, kissing it, bowing to the image, even sleeping with it open to the image next to my bed. If it wouldn't have been a hardcover book and it had it been soft cover, I think I'd have slept with it like a teddy bear. Yeah, I was devoted to Baphomet. I can never forget the fear that saturated my spirit the first night I called him. Imagine you're a lightweight stepping into a boxing ring. The host announces your opponent, and in steps a giant of a man, a heavyweight. You'd feel mighty outranked. That was me. I lied to myself that he was good, and the power I felt was just me feeling his strength. It's amazing how you can lie to yourself when you really want to believe something. I worshipped him for many years before Jesus delivered me from that. I want to present how this entity, Baphomet, is at the heart of Freemasonry and how Masons unwittingly honor and mimic him. I know many of them don't realize what they're doing. I'm not here to accuse or slander. I'm here to present what I think is Baphomet worship subtly disguised. So, Baphomet appeared to a man who was an occultist named Eliphas Levi, and Eliphas Levi sketched what he saw. I'm gonna refer back to that sketch, but I wanna just take a break to say I know that many Masons, especially those who are come down from a line of people that the great great granddad was one and so on and so forth, and now you're one, or maybe you want to join. There's the female counterpart of the Eastern stars, the, the, the brides, the sisters, the daughters. I, I understand how shocking it could be and, and how I might sound anti-Masonic. Well, I am. I don't sound like it. I am anti-Masonic. But I'm not against the person as the individual. I'm against the organization and what they stand for. Mm -mm. We can't stand for that as Christians. And I know what it feels like with deepest empathy. How it feels to be emotionally involved and invested in an organization or belief system, right? I know I have not just experienced life from the inside of a Southern Baptist church. It's not what I am, by the way, but I wasn't always like this. This is an ex-pagan talking to you. I kept the Baphomet picture and worshipped it next to my bed. I, I even had a, a sigil of Lily too, also known as Lilith. That's her Babylonian name. Lily too and Samael, I had their sigil that I drew in red. I, uh, I wore Lily II's effigy as well as that of the Egyptian goddess Maat, like a little, not, not, not a doll, more like a, a necklace of her that I walked around and wore. I was very deep in this. I was very close to these entities, these uh, demon spirits that some people would call gods and goddesses. So I know what it's like to be wrapped up in something and love it and stand by it firmly. But look at me, I came out of it. So I, I would uh, 
at least give it a chance and hear what I have to say about the Masonic beliefs and maybe it's not compatible with Christianity after all. This uh, paganism became a way of life and it drained me bodily, mentally, and spiritually. So let's go with some Bible verses here. I would strongly suggest using KJV. That's the translation I stand by. First Kings chapter 18, verse 21. I want to keep this video somewhat short, so I'm not going to recite them and go into what they mean. Maybe just look them up for yourself and let the Holy Spirit talk to you. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Then read Hosea chapter 2, verse 8. Okay. So you see both verses refer to Baal, and we see in Hosea, the prophet speaks of the corn, wine, and oil, which are meant for Baal. How come Freemasons use corn, wine, and oil in their laying of cornerstones of buildings? Consider the following verses about stones. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Romans chapter 9, verse 33. And Psalm chapter 118, verse 22. Who is the cornerstone of the Masons? They're pouring libations and offering of corn, wine, and oil, which were meant for Baal. Is Christ Jesus or Baal their cornerstone? I leave that up to you. The Masons tell a story of Hiram Abiff, whom they call the stone the builders rejected. Now, considering the previous verses out of Psalms, Ephesians, and Romans, ask yourself, why don't they just refer to Jesus as the stone the builders rejected? I personally believe in my never-to-be-humble opinion, it's because Jesus is not Masonry's cornerstone. This would make Hiram Abiff a type of antichrist, since he is in place of Jesus. Anti doesn't have to mean against, could mean in place of. Now, there is a Masonic saying, is there no help for the widow's son? That is to refer to the Mason himself. It's a distress call, encoded. Isis, the supreme goddess of Egypt, is the widowed mother of Horus. Isis is the mother of Horus. Her consort, or husband, if you will, Osiris is murdered and cut into 13 pieces and thrown into the Nile. Isis found all but one piece, the penis. She put him back together without the missing part. That is why the pagans erected obelisks. It's a memorial to Osiris. But all the while, uh, Horus is still alive, son of Isis, son of the widow. In calling themselves widow's sons, they make themselves sons of Isis, implying that she is the mother goddess of the Brotherhood. They also, I believe, make themselves Horus. Ye shall be as gods. Sound familiar? Yeah. A Masonic floor is black and white. Well, so is that sketch of Baphomet. Baphomet is full of duality, like the checkerboard. You got the one hand pointing up, the other hand pointing down. He's a goat on top, human on bottom, one arm muscular, the other is delicate and curvy. The one arm says dissolve, the other coagulate. He has breasts, but also an erection. There's a moon above him, but also a black sun below. This black sun uh, stands for the hidden light. Masons ask for more light, which is hidden from them. In each degree they go to, they learn a little bit more. 
what they were told is actually not true and they oh that that didn't mean what that meant but uh now you can see what it means that's the kind of thing that they pull i just thought of that so all of these things in baphomet are examples of the duality pointing up pointing down a sun and a moon a man and a goat a male and a female why do you think masons mimic that during an initiation they expose one side of the chest but leave the other side clothed the masons wear one shoe but not the other i personally believe that this is a form of veneration mimicry is a form of flattery and veneration whether the mason is aware of it or not this mimicry is in veneration to this entity this mighty powerful quite evil entity in an open lodge sometimes a bible is left open on the altar to psalm 133 which consists of three verses the last verse mentions mount hermon so this is apocryphal but this is worth examining uh, whether what your beliefs are on the apocrypha wouldn't really matter in this sense because I think it's important to them. The book of Enoch, chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, Mount Hermon is where 200 fallen angels met at the base of that mountain in a collusion. They swore an oath to miscegenate the DNA of human women to hurt the generations. Uh, I truly believe this happened. Let's remember Abraham ate with some of God's angels. And scripture says we have entertained angels unaware. They must be able to look like us and even do the things we do, like eating. Genesis 6 agrees with Enoch. So this union of humankind with angels produced Nephilim as a result of this collusion. Now, considering that the altar has Mount Hermon in writing, in a verse, so we got Mount Hermon, and then we got 33 degrees in masonry, that's the highest you can go. If you go any higher, you'll be in a different secret group. Uh, 33 degrees, highest rank. Mention Mount Hermon. Oh yeah, where is Mount Hermon located? 33 degrees north latitude. You can't make this up. In my never-to-be-humble opinion, I say 2 plus 2 equals 4. Perhaps it is being venerated as a holy site. Fallen angels. Baphomet. I think it's all there. To me, that's what I see. I believe that when it comes to the high-ranking Masons, the ones that are privy to this deep occult knowledge of what's going on, that is with whom their allegiance lies, with the Dark Kingdom. The uh, entry-level Masons don't know this, but now you do. Remember Jesus said, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her fornications. It's no mistake that you clicked on that video. And it's no mistake that someone might have shared it with you. I would heed the counsel of Jesus. Remember Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. So... Now that I've finished with that, uh, I guess I'll give you the gospel. Can't do this without giving you the gospel. The law has concluded that we are all under sin. Herein the law entered that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. You are guilty before a just and holy God. Mason or not, I'm not here to attack Masons. Please hear me. I just want to see people saved. 
and I want to get the gospel out there. You are a sinner under the schoolmaster of the law. All have gone astray. There is none righteous, no, not one. The gospel is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The Lord Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures. All that means is he was foretold by the seers of the Old Testament according to the scriptures. He died, he was buried, and he rose the third day according to the scriptures. Because he lived a sinlessly perfect life, there was power in that blood when it spilled. That blood atonement is what we need to get into heaven. Coin of the realm is the blood of Christ through faith. There's no works involved. The law can't save you, keep you saved, or following the law would prove you're saved. No. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. It's probably the easiest thing you'll ever do in your life is getting saved. Unless you're prideful. But I bind and rebuke that prideful spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Um, oh, I just thought of something. I don't have this one memorized, but... I keep this thing on my wall. I don't know if it's visible, but it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me never dies. So, very clear. Salvation's a free gift through faith, grace alone, in Christ alone. You just believe that, and the very instant you believe that, you're born again, and you're saved forever. You'll be sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. After that, the Holy Spirit will lead you. So, uh, I hope nobody feels attacked, except for maybe the devil and his angels. That's fine. They can be mad. But other than that, I hope no human beings feel attacked. I hope... You learn something, and if anything, you're inspired to look into the things I've talked about. And, uh, all right, God bless. Thanks for listening.